let me say welcome. Is that enough? You can say more now. I'm really happy not only that you're all here, this is a, a great group, but I'm happy to be here myself. I haven't been in this area for a long time except through the, the autobiography of uh, a minor that, that I've, about whom I've read and whose stuff I've read. Um, unlike just about every political candidate in Pennsylvania, uh, I do not have a grandfather who was a minor. <laughs> Sad to say. Uh, my grandfather, after whom I was named, was an automobile worker and uh, took part in the great 30, 1934 strike in Toledo that set up the Flint sit-down strike um, a little later and so on. They also named me after him. But um, that's okay, right? Um, he was suspected, of, you know, as an auto worker. He was sus suspected of being a communist. Uh, no. um, yeah. Um, some some days everybody is, I think, who's been around this stuff long enough. But <laughs> anyway, welcome and have a good time. And uh, we will mix after, you know, when we can, and otherwise we'll listen to each other. The next person, this is John Harris, the president of the Battle of the Homestead Foundation. And John, thank you, thank you. Hi everybody, uh, what a pleasure to be here. And um, we beat the big winds coming out here and hopefully those winds will propel us when we're through to take what we learned and take what we the good vibes that we've uh, developed through meeting together and talking and talking about labor history and people's history. Well, those big winds will propel us a, a bit to uh, work a little harder uh, when we go back and uh, talk to our neighbors and our relatives and go about the business of recreating the history that we want to see. Uh, that we want to see in our in our communities and our societies, and um, I, I want to say I'm really happy to be in this area. My my dad uh, grew up on a farm, Marion Center, Indiana County. Um, I've uh, traveled around this area a lot when I yeah. worked for SEIU, uh, knocking on doors up on the hills and different places for nursing home workers and uh, organizing and representing nursing home workers. And um, I love the area here. I, I, I wish sometimes that, uh, that there wasn't quite as much uh, mines that have been abandoned <laughs> and uh, streams that have been left to run with acid. Uh, but you know what, we got an opportunity now to, to change a lot of that. Uh, and uh, hopefully we'll be able to use some of this federal money and really put people back to work. So um, the Battle of Homestead Foundation was founded um, somewhere around the anniversary of the historic Battle of Homestead, which of course happened in 1892. And about 100 years after that, in the Pittsburgh area, a number of, of workers, uh, union people, uh, academics, artists, community activists got together and said, let's look back at that Battle of Homestead Foundation and let's talk about it and talk about what it means for us today. And out of that came a bunch of really important historical resources. And we're really, we're really, gift, uh, we're really pleased to be able to have a number of the founders of the Battle of Homestead or people at that time who worked to recreate or to create the organization here. Steffi Domike is one of them here. Steffi and Charles McAllister and the others. Uh, Howard, you were around perhaps a little later, but not too much later. Uh, but then there's those that have passed away that, that helped our organization uh, develop. So. Um, I want to say that um, the Battle of Homestead Foundation is uh, very interested in 
education about labor, education about our communities, and uh, honoring a new story or a different story uh, that we call a people's history. And that is when the history books are open, yeah, we, we, uh, we, it's okay, we can read about the people that made a lot of money uh, and uh, developed industry and, and maybe did some good things because when they died they had billions they didn't know what to do with and they gave them away and we can look at art or whatever. But a lot of times the history is not talking about what happened to our great grandfathers and grandfathers and grandmothers, how we made a living and how we fought to be able to make a living and how we fought to be able to have safe conditions at work. And um, we want to tell those stories uh, and we want to tell them because our children are facing as uncertain a future as our great grandfathers did. They're looking at um, a whole new way in which people are making money in our society today. And we're looking at a breakdown, really, in a lot of the things that we thought we thought we had accomplished. We thought we had been able to uh, build a middle class, and now we're seeing that eroding. So that's what we're about, uh, and we're so pleased to be able to come here today. Um, I hope. Lou, you didn't mind the little lecture <laughs> that I gave. And we welcome you all. If you'd like to join us, we are uh, based in the Pittsburgh, Western Pennsylvania area, but a lot of our activities and programs we still do online. And uh, we'd love to build ties with you and your organization and, and have the, the work that you're doing in your communities um, inform the work that we're doing in our communities. So thank you very much for coming. and. Look forward to a really good, really good presentation today. Well, in case anybody here doesn't know who I am, my name is Nick Molnar. Um, to, yeah, that's true, Nick Molnar. I'm not lying to you, bro. I've warned Jim and uh, John and, and the executive board that they should never allow me to have a microphone in my hand. But you guys are going to have to listen to me and you're going to pay the consequences for it. So with that, I'd like to welcome you to Wimber, and I'm also going to put some folks here to work. And I mentioned to Larry Blaylock, seems how he didn't sit down when I asked him to, to come up here and help me out here a little bit. Would you hold this up so everybody can see it? <clears throat> the best easel in the ground. This is a blow up of the map that was passed around to you folks that uh, Melanie Archangelo passed. <clears throat> what that is, is a representation of Wimber. If you look at the center of the map, it says urban center. That means right across the railroad tracks here, that was the urban, urban center. That's where the Arcadia Theater is at. That's where the major company store was at that supplied all the communities around. And each one of these little spots here, except for 32 and 34, were active mines in, in the 1920s. These two had been mined out. The rest of these that have these little dots with the hash marks on it, those were actually communities. They didn't call them you know, by name or anything like that. They gave them a number. So when you talk about Wimber, and each one of these little communities around are actually the mines and the mining communities, and there were hundreds of families who lived in each one of those communities. 1997, by the coal barons, Edward, and Julius, Edward Julius Berwin, Charles Berwin, and Congressman Ellison White. Things haven't changed much today. You still have congressmen getting involved in private corporations. In 1922, there were 8,000 people who lived in Wimber proper. And like I said, in those little communities, those little mines outside of there, there were several hundred families living in each, in each one of those sites. When the strike happened, the company, well, the company itself started out uh, as a steamship company in New York City. They controlled all the, you know, the whole port in New York City. 
They also uh, supplied coal to all the ships that were coming in out of New York City Harbor. And uh, they also supplied coal to the Navy. And that was just what came out of this area. On Good Friday of 1922, the miners voted and went on strike in this, in this community, in these communities around here. There were several thousand, I mean, you see pictures, I believe that John Cashute has some pictures of the coal camp outside of town, because what happened was, after a while, the company threw all the people out of their company houses, and the company owned all the houses around. Matter of fact, not only did they own all the houses, they built all this whole community here on, uh, with, because they had a group of brickworks and all kinds of ancillary businesses, uh, a construction company, a brickworks, plumbers, the whole nine yards, and they basically control and still do control this, in this community fairly uh, rigidly. But when the strike happened, they decided to throw, the, the action of the company was, was to throw everybody out of the houses. And I don't mean they just told them to get out. They threw, literally threw their clothing, their bedding, all their food, everything out into the street, out into the mud. There was really no streets. And they starved them to death, basically what they did. Those families that didn't have relatives that lived outside of this area, some of them lived in tent colonies for 12 to 16 months outside of town on private property. And we United Mine Workers District 2 supplied them with food and whatever uh, they needed, but basically what it did is it almost bankrupted District 2. And in 19, I want to read um, what John Zorachak, who uh, gave a uh, presentation to the International uh, IUP uh, a, quite a few years ago. He's passed away now, and this is what his, what his thoughts were on the strike. So when then, on after we came into here, we finally, after all these strikes, 1927 and to 1933, and finally, warmly he said, the dark clouds disappeared. Oh, the miners of Wimber, we got our uh, sympathetic president, and that got in there. Yes, Franklin Delano Roosevelt, they got that law, the National Labor Relations Act passed, where you could organize. You're allowed to organize if you want to organize. I'm telling you that the law was passed and the union come in. The United Mine Work was short of, was short of funds and money, so they borrowed a half a million dollars from the AFL and put men out in the field for, for expenses to go out and talk to these miners. They, thought car, they brought courage for us to sign and the miners signed up all who wanted the union. I'm telling you, them cars went fast. Everybody was signing up. That's 1933, when they knew that they had finally, that it finally safe. It could be done. We finally got our first union meeting at the Slovak Brick Hall. Remember that phrase, so Slovak Brick Hall. And after a couple of meetings in there, in July of 1933, we, first, we received our charter and Berwyn White finally recognized the Union. Well, that first strike was lost, but in 1933, we got, we got people back in the Union. That was 10 years later. So they, they suffered for 10 years, but the strike itself lasted for 16 months. When they said the Slovak Brick Hall, it kind of made me stop and think because you know, I started asking the president of the club here about the history of this building. And this was the Slovak Brick Hall. That's what the people across the street called it on the other side of the track, so to speak, which is literally on the other side of the track. <laughs> or it was a, or the, the Hunky uh, Insurance Company. Uh, they, they had a, an insurance company because there was no such thing as workers' comp at the time. So the pennies and the nickels and dimes that the workers could save, they put into the, their Slovak insurance company so that in case their husband or child or somebody got hurt or injured, they at least had some money to fall back on. Well, the name of the insurance company is called the Zedak Hall. 
And the, in Slovak, what that means is unity. So every time they talked about the Slovak Hall or the Hunky Hall or whatever, they were talking about this building here. So when the strike happened and the 1933 when the union came in, this is where the first mine workers met at in this building. Upstairs was the gymnasium, which is now a bar, and then upstairs above that was where the insurance company was located at. So the people that are going to get recognized here today, I want them to know that you're standing on some very proud shoulders of a very proud people. And I'm proud to come into this hall and say, welcome here, welcome to solidarity, unity. This is Zoda, and I appreciate it, and I appreciate everybody, everybody coming here. With that, I'm going to turn this microphone over. I'm going to turn this microphone over to, and we have modern technology going here today. We have Kip Dotson on a computer who was supposed to be here but who was diagnosed with COVID yesterday. So, but she's going to be here in, on, online. We also have Amy Niehaus, uh, retired from which union now, maybe? Well, my union, which was a staff union, is Communication Workers of America. Okay. But CWA. Staff, yes, but staff for the National AFL-CIO Organizing Institute. Right. And uh, Kip Dawson, of course, and Ennis, and, and uh, Steffi Dumike. Bonnie Boyer cannot be here today, but I'm going to turn the, the uh, microphone over to these ladies and let them talk about the women in the workforce. Thank you. We had decided um, early on that we would do a, um, do a PowerPoint, but um, uh, knowing my audience, and I know at least half of you, uh, and also knowing um, how things get complicated with technology, Charlie and I decided way ahead of time that we were going to have copies to hand out. And lo and behold, we need the computer for KIPP, and uh, PowerPoint would be a pain in the butt, and we don't really need it. So I'm, uh, you've got my notes. I hope that everybody uh, enjoys them. I'm not going to read them verbatim, but I wanted to give you a sense. Um, Kip and, and, and Amy and I have, uh, have been talking about how, how to present really a history that goes back hundreds of years as to uh, how women have been fighting for equality at work. Um, and so uh, the structure here is that I'm going to give uh, this introduction that sort of, I hope, frames the, the fight that we have been uh, undergoing. Um, and then uh, Kip has uh, a response she wants to talk about uh, her experience as a coal miner and also uh, building uh, unity uh, in, with the black community and with her sisters uh, in the mines. And then we have invited Amy um, to sort of be a respondent and talk about her experience and, her, and, and, and how this fits in, how our comments have fit in with, with her history and her work. So on that, I'm just going to dive in here. I really um, uh, want to frame this, this struggle or this question uh, around the issues of, of fighting for human rights. In other words, the fight for women's equality is tightly knit uh, in the United States and I think across the world with the fight for human rights and equal rights uh, across society. Between this research, I, I was happy to find this, this uh, uh, about um, First Nations women that in, in fact we have uh, a history in this continent of women having a, a, a lot of political power in their communities. That is before the European settlers came and disrupted that. Uh, so we have, um, uh, this is Marie, a quote from Marie uh, Guillard, a French nun who worked with the First Nations people of Canada in the 17th century. And this is what she wrote about uh, Iroquois women. These female chieftains are women of standing, and they have a deciding vote in the councils. They make decisions there, like their male counterparts, and it is they who even delegated as first ambassadors to discuss peace. So women elders voted on, heredi uh, voted on hereditary male chiefs, and they could uh, depose them. So there was a tremendous amount of political power in the hands of uh, indigenous women in this, on this continent. 
and I think that's sort of a, a, a place that we want to start, we want to get back to. <laughs> um, it has taken us hundreds of years, of course. Um, and then the other big issue that really has framed our power uh, in society has been in, uh, the issue of slavery. And so when we, the fights for abolition of slavery really went you know, hand in hand with the fights for women equality, women's equality, political equality, uh, and social equality. Um, and Sojourner Truth and uh, Harriet Tubman are two women I just wanted to put in the mix there, really were uh, leading uh, voices for uh, anti-slavery. They themselves escaped enslavement uh, and fought to end it, and also uh, uh, Sojourner Truth uh, was a voice for uh, women's equality and spoke about the need, I mean, there's a famous quote that I'll misquote, but apparently there weren't any recording devices at the time. And so, um, ain't I a woman is the famous uh, phrase that she, she is said to have uttered and uh, pointed to her muscles, ain't I a woman, I've plowed, I've, uh, I, somebody else here probably can, can, can uh, to say it from memory, but she, she she really stated, she really put it in the front that, that enslaved women uh, deserved rights, deserved uh, equal rights, human rights, and um, and that she was uh, that was part of her fight. So as we as we go through our history, we look at the Emancipation Proclamation as an important place to start. It did not, of course, apply to non-rebellious states, which I had forgotten. I probably knew, but. So these issues, um, uh, uh, when, when the proclamation was issued January of 1863, it said that all persons held as slaves within the rebellious states are henceforth to be free, but that didn't explain what would happen in New York or any, in Missouri or the other states that still had held slavery. So that continues to be a fight. Uh, women's suffrage then uh, was taken up by a lot of women, uh, uh, upper class women, um, and working women, it's, uh, it, be it became sort of uh, the demand for uh, uh, sort of the progressive women's movement of the 19th century. And it, but it wasn't until 1920 that, that we had uh, uh, universal suffrage for women in this country. Um, the, uh, uh, as, as it's been said, women take the vote. We, we fought for the vote, we took the vote. Uh, it wasn't given to us. Um, so uh, it's the 19th Amendment that we have been uh, commemorated a couple of years ago. Um, and so I'm going to just skip into sort of the fight for uh, wage equality and for work equality. Full of labor historians and a couple of labor uh, lawyers who could really fill in the blank here. But I uh, want to say that e the Equal Pay Act of uh, 1963 is one that uh, that my generation ended up benefiting from quite immediately when I entered the workforce. That was an issue that I, I began to understand and that my employment as of the 60s, since I'm a, 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 a child of the 50s, was, was you know, really Im impacted upon by the Equal Pay Act. And uh, again, this was uh, not a complete uh, victory, uh, and, uh, and it was a further fight that um, for the amendment for the Lilly Ledbetter Act of 2009. Uh, Lilly Ledbetter had been uh, in management at Goodyear Tire and uh, was paid significantly less than her male counterparts for her career, uh, which she didn't find out for like 20 or 30 years of her work. Mm -hmm. And when she, when she suddenly found out that she was paid a lot less, she filed a suit but the law at that time only allowed you to go back so far. She couldn't go back the whole 20 years. So, um, so the Lilly Ledbetter Act filled, tried to fill that gap. But we, you know, it's a, so it's a constant fight. Um, and again, to, to wrap back into the, that period, the 60s uh, represented the, the central fight for civil rights in, in this country. So the Civil Rights Act of, of 1964 is the act upon which uh, many of the, the cases that led uh, uh, those of us at, on this panel, or uh, at least Kip and I, to be hired in the jobs that we got in mining and in steel are based on the Civil Rights Act of 1964. Uh, I put Fannie Lou Hamer in here. She was a fighter for voting rights. 
um, in the 60s, a very important and, um, and strong voice for voting rights. She herself uh, was uh, raised on a, uh, lived on a plantation, a former plantation, was kicked off that, that plantation when she became active. Uh, she was, uh, she continued uh, to, uh, to fight. She uh, was one of the founders of the Mississippi Freedom Democratic Party, really an important fight to, for, for, for voting rights in the South. Um, as we look at, at, at what happened with the, um, the, the Civil Rights Act, uh, leaders such as Ola Kennedy, who came from my union, she was a, a rank and filer who was uh, from the Chicago area. I raise her up because she uh, is someone who helped to uh, establish the women's committees in the Steelworkers Union in, in that district, which was then number 31, District 31, now it's District 7. Um, she was active in the ad hoc committee of concerned black steel workers, which was a group of, of black steel workers who were also trying to, to uh, fight for civil rights, fight for equal opportunity within the mills. Uh, the steel mills across the U.S. Uh, had, had various ways of discriminating against people. Uh, and uh, we remember, I see my friend Barney in the back, and those of you who, who also worked in the mills might remember the days when uh, all of, the, uh, all of the, the stonemasons were miraculously mostly Italian. And uh, my, but the metal shop was mostly Polish, and so there were, and the electricians, the highest paid, they were mostly well, some kind of what we call them Johnny Bull last name, uh, you know, an English last name. So there was uh, built-in discrimination within the mills that U.S. Steel was was uh, very active in keeping us separate. So it wasn't until the 1974 consent decree. Uh, which was uh, imposed really upon the union and the company that, uh, that brought that very uh, uh, deliberate discrimination to a close. That consent decree happened because of a series of lawsuits that were filed across the country, uh, most notably in Alabama and Pennsylvania, to fight for equal rights in the steel industry. So it's that settlement, well, to go step back uh, to the um, Civil Rights Act, women were acted, added to that legislation as an afterthought. Uh, 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 it, you know, a Southern uh, congressman added, and the women at the end of the, the list of who would, would benefit from the Civil Rights Act, hoping that it would then dead end, you know, what it would trash the, uh, the legislation. But we were fortunate to have it pass. But we were really, uh, uh, nobody still thought that we should have equal rights or opportunity. Um, the consent decree ended that. We were added to the consent decree as well, in spite of the fact that it was the uh, black men who had filed the suits that we were, we were named under. And so we ended up having uh, an opportunity to get these jobs in the steel industry. Um, and the, and, and the, 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 uh, the consent decree uh, coming down in the 70s, those of us who, I guess most of us in this room lived through that period, um, uh, it, had, it had goals and, and there were, um, uh, we were covered uh, to a certain extent in the, in the way that we were, women were to get half, women and blacks and people with Spanish surnames were uh, to get half of the bids uh, uh, to, to get into the trades and crafts, because it was really the trades and crafts that we had been kept out of, as well as uh, being able to, to move around. Nobody could move from department to department before the consent decree. All seniority was based in the departments. So you might have a dozen or two dozen different departments, and wherever you were hired into is where you were forced to stay, unless you want to lose all your seniority. And um, so that was a very important uh, piece that actually released a lot of the white guys who were trapped, in my case, and I worked at Clareton Coke Works, were trapped on the batteries. Uh, they didn't have the social pull or the right last name to get them into, hired into the trades and crafts. So it was an equalizing force, not just for women, uh, blacks, and people with Spanish surnames across the industry, but also for the white men who did not have the political pull. Um, the Steelworkers Union was a co-negotiator of this settlement, um, and so uh, it was generally accepted across the union, although 
there was a committee. There was a committee coming out of uh, Urban Works that fought pretty hard to to deny us that those rights. But um, as um, so, it, it was uh, that it, that that consent decree was one of three, I believe, nationwide in industry that began to pull us up and and to define what this Civil Rights Act of 1964 would really mean in terms of our work. Um, so uh, the other thing that we've, we have fought for has been the Equal Rights Amendment. It's been proposed. I think it's been, <laughs> we're trying to revive it uh, to say that, yeah, we, we have equal rights in all parts of society. Uh, that's still not on the books. Um, where I want to end this is to introduce um, uh, our colleague uh, Kip Dawson. Uh, and she and, and a little bit about the Coal Employment Project. It, it was um, a nonprofit in, in Tennessee, and uh, it was a group that fought uh, to uh, similarly to the, how the you know worked in the in the in the steel industry fought to get women in to the mines in into the, the, the jobs in the coal industry. <laughs> Um, this is Kip speaking. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Awesome. Awesome. Well, thank you so much to Steffi for um, that wonderful overview of history, which is uh, different from what you read in most history books that gets us to where women uh, got into the steel and coal industries. I, I would need to say a really special thank you to Nick Molnar, who um, is my union brother. Um, I was in District 5, but Nick um, has done so much to make this event happen, and his recognition that uh, they wanted to have a place for women's voices here was really important. And but that's not new to Nick, because Nick um, has had women colleagues in the mines in District 2, including our sister, Bonnie Boyer, who, um, with whom he worked for many years as a part of the union that women had really invaded by that point in large numbers. Um, and I'll get back to that in a minute. Uh, another special thanks to Charlie McAllister, who's envisioned this event and did so much to make it happen despite the obstacles that came up along the way. And to, especially to the Battle of Homestead Foundation. Um, and it was it's uh, an honor to be a part of this tremendous history that everybody in the Battle of Homestead Foundation and my down the street neighbor John Hegar's voice today, um, bringing that home. Uh, all, all the great work that you have done. I'd like to just step out of timeline just for a second to raise a voice with you, um, a name with you. Lisa Parnell Christensen, a sister coal miner who stories could exemplify everything that is real and important about what we're talking about today, is being buried today. Lisa was um, a strong and powerful Alabama Bowline sister, and her family is grateful to be a part of the big family that women miners have brought together around Lisa, and I'll mention that a little bit more, but they, knowing that we are mentioning her name and celebrating her life today as they are marrying her, is meaning a lot to him, to them, as well as to the women miners around the country who are still united as an organization, and I'll get to that in a minute. Um, Stephanie's history is extraordinarily important, um, and certainly the history of the women miners is right in there. The 1974 consent decree, as she has mentioned, wasn't meant by the people who originally filed the lawsuits to open the doors to women in coal mines. But oh my goodness, did it do that. And so it wasn't until 1974 that women who for a long time in coal fields around the country would have given anything to make half the money and have half the job security that the coal miners had in their areas, um, first began to realize or, or have a situation in which they could work to get into the mines. But as you all know, especially the labor lawyers among you and every worker among you who has ever um, struggled, once a law is passed or a judge has decreed something, decreed something, doesn't mean it's going to happen. It's going to take mighty force of organized people 
to um, take a door that has creaked open and slam it all the way open so that people can walk through it. And that's what happened with women um, who were, wanted to get into the into coal mines around on the country. And we were blessed from the very beginning by the vision of a young woman attorney named Betty Jean Hall, who realized that if women were actually going to be able to get into the mines, they were going to need organized solidarity and support. And she is the founder of the Coal Employment Project, which began in 1977 in Tennessee, as um, Steffi has mentioned, and which came to life all over the United States as women started to beat down the doors to get hired into the mines and found that they needed organized support. And one, uh, it, eventually, you know, my workers became a part of that support, but not until the women miners and the women would be miners themselves took it on themselves to organize. And from 1977 um, up to now, because this organization still exists, uh, primarily as a history uh, bringing together and solidarity organization, women miners and women would be miners came together in the Coal Employment Project, which in 1979 evolved its name into the Women uh, Coal Employment Project slash Women Miners Support Team. In 1979, we had our first of what we're going to turn into annual conventions of women seeking jobs in the mines and women seeking to hold on to those jobs and encourage others to get in. And from the very start, even though many women didn't know that it was black steel workers who had made the legal moves that got us to where we were getting, there was a, a solidarity across racial lines which was palpable, partly because among the women who first started to beat down the doors to get into the mines, including here in Pennsylvania, were African-American women who had grown up in coal camps or who uh, knew, knew coal miners, who had brothers who worked in the mines, who were determined that once the, uh, those doors finally began to open, and they were going to be among the people who got hired. I'm going to mention one person in particular because you've just seen her picture on the uh, material that Steffi has uh, sent out. And that uh, last photograph is a picture of little me, but with my amazing sister Carol Davis, as she was known in the mining time, Carol Davis Jones, um, as we were at a reunion of women um, working in various different uh, unions. At that time, she was a member of the SAIU, the, the, and I was a member of the Pittsburgh Federation of Teachers, but we came together with the spirit of our time as coal miners and in the Coal Employment Project, um, finding us still. Carol's story is an incredible one, and I know that um, SEIU people who are here can tell more about how she carried it forward after the mines. And I'd love to talk just about her and Lisa, and then you would get a real sense of the kind of humans that these women coal miners were and are. But I want to give you a little bit more background um, so that you know what we're talking uh, about. Because the Coal Employment Project became quickly a national organization. I mentioned that we had conferences every year from 1979 all the way through to 1992, and then um, some that were not as annual, the last one being in um, 2013 at Eastern Tennessee State University. But listen to the names of the places where these conferences happened. Because at each one of these, women miners who had formed local chapters of the Coal Employment Project, alongside their United Mine Workers of America brothers, because from the start, women miners knew that we would only be as strong as our union was and that we needed the union and the union needed us. And so from the very start, the women miners reached out to the United Mine Workers and said, here we are, we want to build alongside you. And slowly but surely all over the country, and, uh, the United Mine Workers came to rejoice at our presence. Um, I came from a local where this was particularly true, and I'll mention something about that in a minute. So here's where our conferences were held. The first one, Institute West Virginia which is near Morgantown. 
second one in Beckley, West Virginia, then Carbondale, Illinois, Owensburg, Kentucky, Linden Hall, Pennsylvania, Charleston, West Virginia, Price, Utah, Paintsville, Kentucky, Birmingham, Alabama, back in Pittsburgh, Springfield, Illinois, Norton, Virginia, Glenwood Springs, Colorado, another in Pittsburgh, on the Navajo Reservation in Arizona, um, then again in Charleston, Birmingham, Edmonton, Alberta, Canada, where we're members of the same union. And then um, the final one before the one in Eastern Tennessee State University was held in John L. Lewis's hometown of Lucas County, Iowa. We were a national organization, but we also were an international one. And from the start, led by African-American women, hillbilly women, horseback riding women in Wyoming, um, Northern Appalachian women in, in Pennsylvania, where we had a very strong presence, women in central uh, Illinois and Indiana, and a national group. But we were more than that. We were part of the heartbeat of the United Mine Workers during the very bitter and yet beautiful struggles of the 1980s, when the companies were out to destroy our unions and did make big cuts into the strength of the United Mine Workers, but at the same time were met with resolute fightback on the part of the Steelworkers Union and certainly the United Mine Workers Union. And every step of the way, Women coal miners were a part of that. We also reached out internationally because in some circles, the 1980s are known as the Reagan slash Thatcher years because simultaneously we're trying, we're trying to destroy the United Mine Workers in the United States with Ronald Reagan at the helm. He was best buddies with Margaret Thatcher who was doing the same thing in the coal fields in Great Britain. And in 1984, when our brothers and sisters went on striking um, against the Thatcher regime's attempt to destroy the Union in Britain, women miners in the United States were right there alongside the miners' wives who were organizing Solidarity in Britain. And we formed a Solidarity there that lives to this very day, with miners' wives coming to the United States and traveling the coal fields, organized by women miners, taking them around, and our United Mine Workers brothers and with um, miners from the United States going to Britain and touring the coal fields in solidarity with our British sisters and brothers. And that came from the same kind of solidarity extended in many ways to the, the natural inclination of these feisty women who had gone into the mines to spread these the glorious struggles that we were doing at home for our union and with our union to places around the world. And our women did some amazing traveling. Some of the women went to India and China, spreading uh, the word of solidarity among women workers um, and unionists in, in, in those countries. Uh, we, we traveled all over the case. My local union sent me to El Salvador in 1986 in solidarity with workers there who were organizing a union and needed people from the United States to come and protect them from the death squads just by our presence when they held their first annual um, congregation to form a, a federation of unions there. We were a feisty punch, and Nick Molnar, I'm sure, is ready to have anything about Bonnie Boyer, because she represented, and still does, that same kind of spirit. Um, we went through big battles. Uh, the two big ones in 1980s that changed the future of the United Mine Workers were the struggle in 1984-85, against A.T. Massey Corporation, which was out to destroy our union and took some big bites out of it. And in 1989, the big strike against Kitston Coal, where also we suffered some big setbacks, but we didn't give up. We kept going, we kept the struggle going. And um, we have much to be proud of in that struggle. And the solidarity that we were able to build with other unions, for example, the Meat Packers Union, when they went on strike, P9 locals in um, Iowa against the meat packing companies that were also out to destroy unions and were pretty successful. Um, those kinds of solidarity actions live on. Our unions are not as strong as we were in the 1980s. We are not. 
And yet, because history is not a one-way up or down story, um, as my mother liked to describe it, we are we are on a spiral, we humans, and our history is a spiral. There are times when it looks like we're going way backwards, and certainly there are many instances of that in today's world. But we are never going lower than we started. In fact, we keep building on the history of those who made the struggles happen. The, the history that Steffi presented to you here, the history that came before that and continued since it, we keep moving up, even though sometimes we have lost. We keep building on the struggles we've had before us. And here I want to give a tip of the hat to all of those historians who are sitting in this room and to the Battle of Homestead Foundation. Because if it were not for you who are keeping alive our stories, then we would be going slowly downhill right now. But we're not doing that. We are building on the history that we are not only keeping alive, but we're making even more alive. And a tip of the hat right now I have to give to the West Virginia University um, History Department and the young women who have been working so hard to bring these stories into um, safekeeping and to build on them. I want to mention in particular, going back to the woman I started with, Lisa Parnell Christensen. Um, Lisa was a coal miner in Alabama who epitomized the recognition that black workers and white workers needed and still need to recognize our common need and to work and build together. And down there in Alabama, a, a, a very alive part of the United Mine Workers, as you can see in the recent strike that has just happened there against Warrior Matt Cole, Black and white miners standing together with women miners firmly right there in the middle and holding, helping to hold things together. That struggle may not win the rights that the union miners went out to win. That is full union recognition at the mine and all the rights that go along with it. But it's keeping alive in Alabama what the black workers who got us that consent decree were out to get. And that is that we are in this stuff together and we are going to continue to build together. And today, at Lisa's funeral, that spirit is being celebrated by her family and by the miners and the other people of Alabama who are gathering to say goodbye to her. And as her sister put it, to say that Lisa is gone, but she will not be forgotten because the West Virginia University students who interviewed her for oral history are keeping her voice right there alongside all the other voices that you all, everybody in this room, has been working and will continue to work to make sure do not disappear. And as one of our sisters said, if Lisa were sitting in this room right now, she would be, have a big grin on her face. She would look at all of you, she would raise her fist, and she would say, hey, buddies, brothers and sisters, don't mourn for me. Joe Hill said it right. We gotta keep organizing. And it's in that spirit that I want to thank you all very much for making this event happen and for making it possible for me to be with you. I, that was not easy, I know that. I am so grateful and I'm so happy to sit back and listen now as the rest of you play this forward. In solidarity, forward ever. I'm just gonna try and pull this together. All of you here are here because you know a little bit about history, you wanna celebrate victories of history, you wanna see a better future for other people, not just ourselves, that's how unions work. Quick story. My grandfather, I never had the pleasure of meeting him. He was a New York City fireman. He died young from work-related injuries. No Social Security, no union, no nothing. Grandma, who I also never met, marched for women's rights to vote. I'm hoping it's genetic. Mm. <laughs> she marched for women's rights to vote. My mother said she must have been organizing because she went to meetings a lot. Good. My mother skipped that. She was too busy raising us and fighting for herself which was important. 
But these things impact your communities. And I live in Somerset County. I live down the road in Payne Township, right on Spruce Run. You want to check out the fish, call me. <laughs> Although I don't kill them there. They're too precious. Everybody knows Clear Shade? Who knows Clear Shade, how good that is? Anybody know Spruce Run? Mm -hmm. That's also a naturally reproducing wild trout stream. Mm. So anyway, what it does, when you become active, you don't have to be working to be active. I've been retired 10 years now. I love raising hell. There's lots of things we can do for our community, for our children, for our friends, for our neighbors, because labor is the foundation of good communities. People have jobs that don't pay them enough to come home and take care of their kids. That's not very uplifting. People have jobs where they can come home with their paycheck and take care of their family. The community comes up. It's something very, very important to remember. Myself, I got so lucky. My mother told me to learn how to type because I didn't have the patience to wait on tables. <laughs> I type 125 words a minute. <laughs> I can't wait on tables. I tried to relieve a friend who was tending bar wines. I couldn't even keep up with a shot and a beer. So it's hard work. So tip your servers. Talk to your servers. Teach your children. Talk to your neighbors. It makes a difference because I had the privilege <laughs> I didn't listen to my mother. She wanted me to go to secretarial school. I said, I can already type and take shorthand and correct the boss's grammar. I don't think I'm going to waste two years. Best. I wound up at a major university because she waited on tables so brother could go to college. He was a C student and was hiding his failing grades in his sock drawer. <laughs> I was a girl. I should learn how to type. Okay, but it worked out just fine because I went there in 1967 and there were all these wonderful students looking for a worker to organize. And there I was. And that was the biggest gift I ever got. Because when I realized you could get stuff, one of the things we did was we fought for a daycare center because there were a lot of people there who had to take care of the kids while they were working. So that was one of our first fights when we got a daycare center. We tried petitions, we tried talking, we tried, finally we took our kids to work and changed diapers on the president of the university's desk, and we got a daycare center. <laughs> Same thing with work. I left there and then I moved to New Jersey I got tired of Long Island, been a little boring, but anyway, and there, because I had taken a civil service test, I was doing office work before I got there. Well, I got a job at a plant that paid a lot more and I didn't have to know anything yet. I had to work my butt off, but I made more money. And it was a plant where women had to wear skirts. We had to wear uniforms because it was a soap plant. We wore skirts. I started there in 1974. What do you think happened next? <laughs> they gave us pants and we took men's jobs. We made more money and it was easier. <laughs> Sorry, gentlemen. Now, in the mines, I've got to tell you, I don't know if I could do that, to be perfectly honest. Okay? But they did have one machine there that was a big shaker. That Back when they used to use powdered soap all the time, they had a big thing. It was about uh, maybe a quarter of the size of this room with a grate on the bottom. You got to get into it and it would vibrate to break up the clumps. And you're in there with high boots, a hoe, and a face mask breaking up laundry clumps. Yeah. That I sort of could do. I don't think I'd make it in the mines. So how many here ever worked in the mines? Congratulations, thank you. Finally a job I definitely could not do. <laughs> but, so anyway, what you do makes a huge difference. That legislation that they were just talking about is the reason I didn't have to pack soap anymore because packing soap was the worst job. Your, every muscle from your fingertips to your neck would be screaming as you're grabbing 12 bars of soap and stick them in the case. I got to be a machine operator. And the people who were packing the soap, because I knew that, I said, you give me the high so sign when you need an extra break. Because the, the machine operator didn't have to do anything unless the machine jammed. But this machine was magic. It would jam whenever the packers needed a break. <laughs> the foreman loved us too because we were making good production. We weren't goofing off. We were ready to make a record of how many cases that line ran. Got down to the last case. Do we want to break the record? I asked the packers. They said, nah. <laughs> the guy on the next line was going nuts. Jumping up and down like a terrier. What's the matter with you girls? What's that? I said, what's it to you? He said, I'm a stockholder. And with this I'll end, I told him to go hold his stock. <laughs> so what you do matters, so do it. 
vote, volunteer, tell people about history, tell people about current events. Because if you're just listening, and the local stations are just as bad now since Sinclair bought them, if that's their only source of knowledge, we're not giving them everything we can give them. So spread the word, spread your efforts. We can change things and make things a lot better. Thank you. Hey.